This is a story about two boys. One boy was born in California, conceived in the Midwest in 1961. One other boy was conceived in Washington, D.C. and born in a snowstorm in Washington, D.C. in 1961 at D.C. Columbia Hospital. Each boy grew up feeling totally alienated, totally weird, totally convinced that he came from a different planet. Each of them had one stroke of good fortune. They crossed paths, and it was just by sheer luck these two aliens crossed paths. They became incredible friends and had a friendship that was beyond words, that was beyond thought. They could finish each other's sentences. When they were together, they were so telepathic. It's like they were brothers. It's like they shared the same mind. When they were together, they used to call themselves the Chosen One. Everything the other one said was awesome. People around them used to say, why don't you guys just get it over with and fuck each other, okay? <laughs> the two would laugh at them and know that these people had no idea how cool the other one was. They would argue with each other. You're awesome. No, you're awesome. No, you're awesome. No, you're awesome. But you're the man. No, you're the man. I guess I am the man. You are. No, but you are. On and into the night. They would watch really stupid movies for their comedic impact. Anything with Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> the more serious the movie, the more the boys would laugh. They worked very hard in the living room, aping Sylvester Stallone's sagging face. They dissected the movie over the top as one dissects Moby Dick or Ulysses. They got down every nuance of Sly's tortured face. They believed they were the funniest, coolest, most awesome guys on the planet. Together, they were invincible walls of mirth. They did so much cool shit, you will never be able to finish a book about the two of them. The epic movie could never be made because Lawrence of Arabia was four hours and it, it, it was too long for theatrical release. This one would have to be about 50 hours and just no one would take it on. And you couldn't release a film called The Two Most Awesome Dudes Who Ever Was. <laughs> the two guys spent years together traveling through many countries, going through high times, low times, times of no money, no hope, no chicks, no friends, nothing but each other. A little while down the line, one comes into some money and says, hey man, you're living in that dump. I got this cool place over here and you're awesome and you can't be living in a dump. Why don't you live here? And the other one said, that's great, that way we'll always be together and we will be the chosen one. The mind will be in full effect at all times and earth will come to us. We will be awesome at all times. And each one knew the other one was right. So they shared a house and it was amazing. They went to the whiskey, a go-go, one night to watch a band. It did not matter what band it could have been. It did not matter who was with them. No one survived the treatment they gave people. It could have been Black Sabbath in 1972, their common favorite band, and they still would have bagged on Ozzy because everything was funny when they were together. So the two of them are watching a band at the whiskey, laughing until they urinate their pants at how funny the band is when actually the band is kicking much ass. They're making it into the worst gig on earth and having the greatest time.
people are passing them, recognizing both of them and saying hello. The two say hello back, and once the person who said hello turns away, they make static motions at that person's ass with air knives. <laughs> and laugh and high-five and bond even further. <laughs> the two boys were a walking riot at all times. Maybe not to anyone else, but each other. They left the whiskey, and they went all the way through West Hollywood towards Venice with their middle fingers out the window, flipping off all of West Hollywood and Westward. Very immature, but they thought they were the funniest fuckers on earth. And they were. They got back to the house in time to go to the video store to rent Rocky V. And they even started getting ready for the movie two hours before they would watch it by looking at each other and go and saying, Go for it. No, you go for it. No, you fuck me. No, I'll fuck. No, you fuck me. No, I'll go for it. No, you go for it. Hey, you gotta go for it, right? You I got pulled out of the womb, right? Yeah, with a monkey wrench. That's why half of my face doesn't work. And that's why I'm over the top. You see me when I'm going, when I, when, you know, I take it and I take it over the top. You see my face and I go, Eeeh! A lot of people said I'm an idiot, right? But I'm very erudite. I mean, if Mel Gibson can do Hamlet, I can do Macbeth, right? Look, to be or not to be, see, I can do that, right? A lot of people don't know that I'm a very erudite and intense actor, man. But one day people will see my full potential. They think I'm a meathead. But what they don't understand is I'm worth $160 million, right? They might hate me, but I could buy them. <laughs> the two boys laughed all the way back from the video store knowing that Rocky V was going to be the greatest movie ever made because those two would be watching it. And they decide that right before the film, they better go get some food so they can eat hearty as they watch this incredible film that's going to make them laugh until they piss their pants. They go to the store and they buy their food and they're walking down the street making fun of Sylvester Stallone like there's no tomorrow. And they're 30 feet away from their shared home and they're laughing and saying, Yeah, you go for it. No, I'll go for it. You, you got to go for it. Because if you don't go for it, someone else will, right? And then you're just standing around. That's why I go for it always, right? And some of the films I make, right, are kind of stupid like that one. Rhinestone, right? A lot of people say that guy's a moron, right? I mean, that movie's so gross, I can't even watch it, right? <laughs> and right then, two guys came out of the bushes and put guns in their faces and said, This is a holdup. And the two guys went, eh. Okay. And the boy who was born in Washington, D.C., was told to get on his knees, and he got on his knees, and he had a gun at the back of his head. He looked over at his buddy who was born in California, and he looks down, and the boy from California is lying face down on the sidewalk with a gun at the back of his head, and then a moment later, the two boys were ordered to get up and walk towards their own house, because they were going to go inside. The boy from Washington, D.C. is the one who had the key and knew very clearly that once they were taken in, they were going to be marched into the back room, told to kneel down on the ground, and they would be shot execution style in the back of the head. So the boy from Washington, D.C. realized they had about 45 to 60 seconds to live and was vainly trying to figure out a way to turn this all around. The boy from Washington, D.C. opened up the door took five steps in, dropped the groceries, saw that the TV was on, furiously thought of an idea of maybe trying to give these two sons of bitches the VCR and the television, and maybe they would just go the fuck away when the boy from Washington, D.C. heard a slight scuffle. Bang! He ran out of the back of the house, ran up an alley, made a left, made a right, made a left, went to a phone call, dialed 911, and said, I live at 809 Brooks Avenue in Venice, California, and there was a shooting at my house. Can you please come here? So I walked into the middle of the street, not knowing what the fuck to do with myself. 30 seconds later, a plainclothes cop car comes racing up the street towards me, orders that I go to the side of the curb and put my hands on my head. They arrest me, throw me in the back of a car, drive me up to my own house, 
and keep me there for 20 minutes and make fag jokes outside the car and point at me and call me sweetie. I keep asking in vain, can you please tell me what happened to my friend Joe Cole? He might want to know how I'm doing. He might be scared. I need to talk to my friend Joe Cole. He's my roommate. He's my best friend. Where's Joe Cole? And the cop says, sweetheart, just calm down. We need some details on your partner. My partner? And the cop said, yeah, what's your partner's name? I said, my partner, my roommate. My other half is Joe Cole. He's 30 years old. And uh, can you please take me out of these cuffs? I haven't done anything wrong. Why have you arrested me? I need to talk to my friend. Do you need the key to my house? You might need to get in there. Some guys had guns and they put them to us and there's a shooting. Can you tell me what's going on? Finally, one cop sits down in the car and he's working on his piece of paper on his clipboard. I said, excuse me, sir, my hands are turning blue. And also, can you please tell me what happened to my friend Joe Cole? And the cop turns around with very studied nonchalance. And he said, oh, he's dead and went back to his clipboard and wrote like it was no big deal. So they held me for about nine or ten hours at the police station and let me go in the morning and my friend took me back to my house and we were preparing to clean up as much blood as comes out of a six foot four young man who gets shot in the left cheek. And uh, I was getting ready to mop up that living room and me and my friend were saying, we can do this, right? Yeah, we can do this. And we're getting psyched up to mop up so much blood. And we get to the front porch and there's television reporters there, National Enquirer, and there's a big puddle of blood right on the dirt on the front porch and there's flies eating it. And I look down and this puddle of blood is very big and very deep and very viscous and there's a lot of flies eating my dead friend's blood and that was Joe Cole, man. And so I went by the reporters and I've never said no comment to a reporter in my life. I said fuck you a lot of times and I've never said no comment. I felt like I was in Watergate or something. So I walked into the place and I had to go right into Joe Cole's room and get his phone book and call every single fucking number in that phone book from A to Z and tell them the most horrible news I could think of. Between phone calls, I would have to steady myself so I wouldn't start crying and convulsing. I would have to calm myself down so I could make the next phone call. So when I talked to that person, that person would hear a voice and not somebody on the other line going... <laughs> <laughs> so I did that for a while. And then it took us a couple of days of frantic moving and we moved every piece of furniture and gear out of that house and threw it in a storage space. And I lived in someone's office for a few weeks and went on tour. And I'll tell you what, man. All that talk about kill a motherfucker like it ain't no thing and all that tough gang banging shit, you know what? I think it's fucked up and stupid. Because when someone dies, it's not like in those movies like, like Lethal Weapon 3 where they just die and you know how, how Mel seems to kill people and never has to really answer for it and the bodies stack up and afterwards he just you know, paid $7.50 to see a lot of cars blow up, a lot of uh, silicone impregnated breasts and a lot of dead bodies. You know what happens when people get shot? They don't like struggle for air and say something witty and dramatic as they die. They just fall on the ground, shit their pants, and have their brains come out the back of their fucking head, man. The last few months have been really hard. It's been really rough, but there's one upside to the whole thing. Because, like I said, I got enough horror to sink your ship, okay? And who needs to hear it? It just will bum you out, and it's just a self-indulgent blues jam. And I'm not going to pull you through it because I pulled you through it enough. There's one good thing that comes from this. When something this powerful happens, there's a powerful lesson you can get. And here's what. I'm not trying to say I'm some goody-goody, you know, oh, I love you all, or any that, that new wave shit, but look, I don't know many of you people. I don't even know how many of you are here tonight, but I'll tell you one thing. I like all of you, all right? And I don't like all of you like I want to move into your house. I want you to come over and hang out with me and shit. I mean, but I like you. I really do. And I'm really glad you're here. Not because you paid whatever to get in here, because you're alive. And I don't even know you, and I, I love your life, because you got one. And if Joe was here now, he'd be, he'd be here, but he's not. And I don't believe in an afterlife. You step on a bug, it dies. I shoot you in your face, and you die. And you don't come back. And that's my belief, okay? There's no ghosts. There's no afterlife. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm a kind of a cash and carry guy. Wash and wear. So, with that belief in mind, I reckon that while you are here, since you're not going to Disneyland, 
and all that shit and hang out with Jim Morrison and, Hen and get to jam with Hendrix and Miles and all that cool shit. If I were you, I would really kick a lot of ass while you're here. Because when you die, when you're dead and you die, you're fucked because you don't get to go hang out and do cool shit anymore. So if you're thinking of going home and putting a fucking needle in your vein and shooting heroin, always know one thing. At least my opinion is, that's fucked, okay? Glorious thoughts of suicide. If you ever kill yourself, I would love to be able to bring you back to life just so I could kick your ass. I think there's just no time for drinking this Jack Daniels poison. There's no time for hanging yourself. There's no time for blowing your brains out. There's no time for heroin. As bad as life is, people like Daryl Gates, you know, uh, people training you to be a racist moron. There's a lot of bad shit out there. And as bad as life gets, life is fucking awesome, man. Because the alternative, going to a funeral, looking at a little plastic box that contains your friend, sucks. So all of you are the same on one level. All of you in here are just like me on, in one way. You're all breathing. And that's the coolest, man. And you have to go with that. Because there's nothing else to go with. That's the only break you get. You get to live tomorrow. You get to go on. You get to move forward. And it might not seem like much, but for me, it's right now, it's all I'm hanging on to. And it's all I've got going. And it's what I'm going to stick with. So, on that note, I just want you to know that I hope you had a great fucking time tonight. I want you to live two ways, long and strong. Good night.